Chechen struggle with Russia began in the 1790s. As the Tsar's army pushed south between the Black and Caspian Seas, it encountered the warlike peoples of the Caucasus Mountains. The Chechens in particular relished the challenge, and in resisting Russian invaders, these warriors found a theme to unify a disparate people. Before the 20th century, you can't really talk of the Chechens as a single nationality. Very different kind of Chechens. There are about 200 different tapes or clans. There are different religious groups. Chechnya served a purpose for the Russians too. It's their Wild West, a place of beauty, cruelty and romance. Great Russian writers of the 19th century, like Lermontov and Tolstoy, served here as army officers, setting some of their most famous works in these mountains. The Russians tried cutting down the forests, and they tried burning the villages, and of course all that did was in fact bind the Chechens closer together, um, different villages, different groups, all um, bound together in one tradition of resistance which basically continued pretty much for 200 years. Yes, historically Little Chechnya has always been the rock that breaks Russian policy and ambitions in the Caucasus. After the 1917 revolution, communism came to Chechnya. The old empire was transformed into the USSR. Soviet rulers tried to disarm the Chechens, but they too failed. Only the terrible genius of Stalin managed it, but by deporting the entire Chechen nation in 1944. It was the 23rd of February. A holiday, Red Army Day. In one mountain village, there wasn't enough transport for everybody. So they locked the people in their homes, surrounded them with hay, and set the village on fire. Thousands were burnt alive. I was eight years old. I remember there was thick snow and a bit of wind. We were put in cattle cars. We were cold and we were hungry. There was no toilet. We traveled for a month like that. I remember well, a lot of people died. I don't think you can overestimate the importance of what the 1944 deportations meant for the Chechens. Um, possibly the only proper comparison is what the Holocaust uh, means for Israel. Um, Chechnya was basically wiped off the map. It didn't exist for 13 years. Um, there were no Chechens left in Chechnya. Not one of the people filmed in this Stalinist paradise was a Chechen. They were all Russian settlers. Chechens learned the lesson, never again. We Chechens got our anti-Soviet feelings with our mother's milk. By the time you were three or four, you knew that this was a criminal state. The deportees were only allowed back to Chechnya in the 50s, after Stalin died. But even at home they found Soviet discrimination continued. Chechen national culture was to be trampled on the road to a socialist utopia. God help you if you spoke Chechen on a bus. If you were young, you got a slap. If you were an adult, you were dragged before an official, a Russian. And not told to speak Russian, not 
don't speak in Chechen, but speak a civilized tongue. So we were made to understand that Chechen was uncivilized. During the 60s and 70s, the Soviet system kept up its struggle to integrate Chechnya, but natives of the region were given little power. By the end of 1991, the USSR broke into 15 new states. Boris Yeltsin took over the largest, Russia. In Chechnya, a long-suppressed culture burst into the open, and they declared independence. The Kremlin was horrified. Moscow refused to recognize Chechen independence, and the Chechens failed to realize the seriousness of their situation. The Chechen nationalist movement was full of illusions. We believed we could force the Russians to give us freedom. It was the romance of independence. Johar Dudayev was the father of Chechnya's independence. Dudayev was the first Chechen to become a general in the Soviet armed forces, but from the beginning he was a controversial figure. Johar Dudayev was the most extraordinary figure I think you could ever encounter in the former Soviet Union, and he talked about history and destiny and the Chechen people in this very mesmerizing fashion. And there was actually something rather unhinged about him. Dudayev had fantastic plans. He was big on arms manufacture. He had his eight-year-old son posed for the BBC with the prototype Chechen-designed Wolf submachine gun. There was crime flourishing almost everywhere in the former Soviet Union, but Dudayev's fiefdom had to be seen to be believed. In the center of Grozny was an open-air arms bazaar where you could easily equip a small army. Like Casablanca in the 30s, Grozny attracted adventurers and journalists. The photographer Stanley Green was entranced. It was like unbelievable, Chechens <clears throat> marching through the streets and seeing the fashion show of their, of their new uniforms and uh, seeing Dudayev and seeing these guys running around on horses with beards. I mean, I have to be honest, I was uh, quite overwhelmed by the whole thing. But the thrills also made Chechnya a grim place to live. Dudayev failed the basic tests of government. It's a year and a half since Dudayev paid our pensions. We don't need him. We have no strength left. Yeltsin cut the power off and Dudayev's regime began to collapse. Armed resistance to Dudayev broke out and the Republic broke up. Ruslan Khaspulatov led one of the factions. I made it clear both to Moscow and Dudayev. Imagine, I called a demonstration and half a million people came. He understood he'd either have to step down or face the consequences. And he did begin negotiations. But at that same moment, Moscow began its military adventures in Chechnya. Kaspolatov was also unacceptable to Yeltsin. He wanted a more pliable Chechen leader. So, in November 1994, Yeltsin tried a coup d'etat. Russian soldiers pretending to be mercenaries were sent in to back anti dudayev fighters heading into Grozny. Dudayev crushed the coup. To compound the Kremlin's embarrassment, Several Russian soldiers were captured and paraded on TV. Yeltsin's scheme blew up in his face. Yeah. 
Я работал в никак. In Moscow, the president called in his security council. The crunch had come. The Kremlin readied 40,000 troops, the biggest internal security operation since the revolution. D-Day was set for the 11th of December 1994. Three armoured columns would move on Grozny. But the army was nowhere near ready. They had few maps and poor intelligence, especially on how ordinary Chechens would react to invasion. I remember about a week before the war started, sitting in a cafe in Grozny, talking to the man who ran the cafe. He had a little business in Moscow, um, he spoke Russian, um, was a nice uh, entrepreneur. Um, he said he despised President Jokhar Dudayev, who was supposedly his leader. And yet, when um, the question arose, what would happen if the Russian troops came in, he said, I'm going to go and fight. Only one of the three columns got anywhere near Grozny. Civilian protesters who stood in the roads were crushed. But the Chechen fighters had their own response. We put petrol lorries in our convoys. It's against all military practice. So it was easy for the Chechens to destroy our convoys. The Chechen war had begun. I was standing in Manutka Square and we looked up in the sky and there was this silver plane, light, hit the light, hit it, and, was, and it turned into like it turned up like a cross. And we all marveled at how beautiful it was and then it came straight down and started dropping bombs. It was the first time that we, quite a lot of us realized that we had gotten ourselves in some serious, um, well, some serious shit. Grozny became a vision of hell, and not just for Chechens. Thousands of Russians, Stalin settlers, lived there and so died there.